you could do anything in this world, regardless of income or skill, what would it be? What is your true passion? As an attorney and an educator, I'm really lucky because I get to live my passion every single day of the week. Through my students and my clients, I get to see the magic that happens when the left brain and the right brain come together to play in the most creative of ways. My talk is all about following that passion. Creativity lives inside all of us. But those of us who follow our creativity, we become the daydreamers and the trailblazers. We all have this spark yearning to be free. You feel this tap on your shoulder, you hear this whisper in your ear, and suddenly you realize you've been visited by this magical muse. She calls you to question your current path. She begs you to consider the realities of what could be. She shows you your possible future. She causes you to consider and wonder if what you're doing right now, that stable, safe choice, is the best choice for you. You're suddenly at a crossroads, and you have to make a decision. Do you stay in your safe, comfortable zone, or do you take the plunge and follow your passion? I was visited by this muse back when I was in my undergraduate degree. I was a junior, I was studying accounting, and my dream was to become a tax attorney. <laughs> Cassie. The muse reached out to me, and she gave me an idea. What if I did this wacky thing, and midway through my undergraduate, change my major? Stick with business, but go into entertainment. You'll never turn back, you'll never question it. I made that choice, I took that leap, I followed my passion, I went off to law school, I studied intellectual property and entertainment, and I have never regretted a moment. Dealing with the creative world is an amazing opportunity for me. Every single day, I get to hear individuals share their dreams with me. It is absolutely fantastic to see artists reach out, trying to find the answers and information as they search out to follow their dreams. The artists start in this pre-production process. This is when they start thinking about their goals. How do I get from that vision in my head to something physically that I can actually market? This is also the time when the little voices start to visit. Those questions, those concerns, that fear, that doubt, as well as that joy and excitement. This is part of the toll that that artist pays. That hesitation and fear of leaving a real job. How many times have you heard someone say that they wish they could have gone into a more artistic career, but they wanted to stay in that safe, stable career where they had found their rooting. You have to make a decision. Do you take that muse, shove her in a box, jam her in your attic, and forget about her, or do you choose to take the plunge? The artists that do enter into the production process next. And in production, this is where they see that magical vision turn into a physical being. What's lived in their head becomes an actual, tangible, marketed item. Then they move on to one of the most challenging parts, which is the actual post-production. How do I get this product into the hands of my consumer? Who are my consumers? My clients and students who figure out this formula, who their market is and how to reach them, are the ones that reach the greatest levels of success. They thrive on partnering business and creativity. My job is to try and bridge the chasm between business and creativity. This is where I live. One of my favorite examples comes from a client who's a songwriter. As a songwriter, he had an offer roll in from a company that was owned by a very business-minded individual. So when he presented the contract, the clause regarding my client's work explained that he would come in from 9 a.m. to noon, Eastern Standard Time, and would write music. Then the rest of the actual workday would be spent doing administrative and service type jobs. Now I had to tackle this clause in two parts. The first thing I looked at was this scheduled creativity. I've had creative moments. I'm certain many of you have had creative moments. 
I personally find muses to be rather spontaneous spirits. I didn't understand this nine to noon concept. If any of you can schedule creativity, please see me at the next break. We'll bottle it up and we'll sell it. I went to the business owner and I said, where is this creative schedule coming from? And he answered very uniquely and he said, I'm a man who uses time cards. That's how I run my business. Why should your client be any different? To him, he was confounded. He came from the business world. And I sat down and I chat with him, and one of the things that we discussed during that chat was maybe creativity should be measured on a different field, possibly a number of compositions per week or some other format. We then started discussing the concept of actual work. Now, any of you who've ever learned any creative art or have gone through the production process know that creativity is very much work. As soon as I sat down with him and started talking about the fact that creating a piece of art, creating a song, or creating other, any other piece of artistic content is just as challenging as creating that large business proposal or that big project, this light went on. He had this aha moment, and suddenly creativity became a real job to him. One of my other clients that always makes me think about the space between business and art is a client who I adore who's a jewelry designer. And she came into jewelry from actually the business side of the world. While still maintaining her day job, she started going out and buying amazing gems, beads, clasps, and tools, and started teaching herself the art of jewelry. She started creating all of these amazing pieces, revisiting them, refining them, giving them names, and she got to the point once she had a collection, she started approaching different companies. Now, instead of going to your traditional jewelry stores or clothing boutiques, she decided to reach out to art galleries. And she contacted me around this time and asked for my help. And I thought it was really interesting, why art galleries? And she slowed down for a second and she said, wait a second, wait a second, I'm not a jeweler, I'm an artist, and my medium is beadwork. Oh, hey. She reached out to these art galleries, and the art galleries started to talk with her. They were concerned about her price points. She was charging $150 for her least expensive piece. And the gallery owners were worried that people wouldn't want to make the investment. They wouldn't see the return. Although her beads and her layouts were amazing, she looked at every single owner and expressed one very important thing. She explained that these pieces are original. There is only one. It came from a piece of her. And that these individuals who were buying her jewelry were actually purchasing a piece of her soul. This wasn't mass manufactured. This wasn't something that wasn't unique to her. It was one of a kind. As soon as the gallery owners realized this, a number of them started chatting with her, started carrying her jewelry, and were very pleased in the fact that she had good commercial success. She was also thrilled because she had a customer base who understood her and understood the products that she was offering. It's a magical time when I get to see that chasm between art and business bridge together. That's one of my favorite times during working with all of my students and all of my clients. One of the other things that's really exciting dealing with this unity between the two is dealing with the business side of art. When the economy takes a turn for the worst, as sometimes happens, we see our entertainment industry survive. We are a society that will budget for entertainment, be it video games, music, or film. We need that creativity to thrive. And I'm thankful, due to the growth of various nonprofits that support the arts, entertainment, and theater. Because not only do these businesses help complete us and make us whole, but they also help our children. Study after study has been done explaining that when children are exposed to the arts, they thrive and do better in technical sides of education. So the more exposure we can give to our children to different forms of art, the better off they will be when going into different technical skills. 
such as math, science, or business. So I ask of you, the next time you feel that tap on your shoulder, you hear that whisper in your ear, take a breath, and just listen. Don't let the voices from the business side come rushing into your head, making you call into question the choices that you may make. Keep in mind, those trailblazers in our artistic industries had to unify that chasm between the art world and the business world. They were able to do so successfully. They followed their passion, they knew their market, they researched their art, they perfected their skills, they stood their ground in negotiations, they made solid deals, they found a strong following, they were able to figure out how to take their passion and make it their career. They turned their muse's message into their livelihood. So I challenge each and every one of you, the next time you hear that muse, take a moment, take a calculated risk, never look back, and follow your passion.